Can I can I introduce to you the wonderful Lily Hawker Yates from LP Archaeology, who has been um, one of the many stars of the show at St Mary's Church in Stoke Mandeville, which is one of the HS2 major burial grounds. Um, and Lily's going to talk about the St Mary's Field Museum, which if you haven't heard about it yet, um, you'll want to go and find out a lot more. It's been absolutely brilliant. So thanks, Lily. Thank you. I'll put my little microphone yeah. on. Oh, that's the way around. There we go. Okay. Yeah, I'll start by saying what I was going to do is get like a little QR code that you could scan that would take you through to all of the videos, but I wasn't sure how it would work on the screen. Um, so it didn't end up doing it. But if you do want to find out more about the Field Museum um, after this, if you go onto the HS2 YouTube channel in the Heritage and Archaeology playlist, basically a lot of the recent videos will be our videos that we made. Um, during uh, the Field Museum, which was May to September last year, um, and also um, some new ones which we're making through the post X, or the start of the post X and conservation. So, however, um, what I'm going to focus on uh, now is uh, educational opportunities, um, predominantly for the public. If I've got time, which I suspect I probably won't, um, I'll talk about um, some that we did with uh, to do with archaeology uh, training archaeologists. Uh, however, mainly this is going to be about the educational opportunities for members of the public um, who came to visit the Field Museum. So, um, St Mary's Church in Stoke Mandeville, if you don't know anything about it or where it is, it's in Buckinghamshire. Um, as Andrea said, it's one of the HS2 um, burial grounds. It's a rural uh, site, um, so a medieval church uh, churchyard and then uh, a kind of landscape around it. Um, so... We excavated, you can see this is um, when we were taking uh, the rubble off the church. So basically the church looked like this into the middle of the 1800s. Then it was abandoned, left to fall down. And then eventually in the 1960s, it was pulled down by the Royal Engineers um, because it was essentially a dangerous ruin. Um, so when we came to begin to excavate it, uh, we had to take off all of the rubble, a lot of uh, trees and undergrowth which had... Uh, grown up over it um, so that was the first stage uh, and then excavating the uh, wider landscape um, as well as the church and the churchyard so um, when we were doing the eval and taking the rubble off the church we did have an initial field museum as a little pilot um, and that was um, an open uh, weekend and also some educational courses where members of the public came in to um, learn how to uh, record, clean and, and do some 3D scans of uh, stones from the church. Um, and that kind of really was a yeah, pilot for our Big Field Museum, which was then uh, last summer, so 2021. Uh, delayed because of COVID, so it should have been slightly earlier. But um, So we were located in the tent. The tent covered the church and the churchyard. Um, and we had kind of a long portion of the tent. So we had a viewing platform which overlooked the excavation area. And then we had um, an area which we set up as a museum and educational space. So it had a dual purpose. Um, it all came flat packed and it left flat packed. So it's all recyclable and very eco. Um, so this was uh, once we'd finished putting all of the pieces together. Um, and uh, because it all came flat packed, it meant it was very easy to move around. So we had a layout um, which was for museum, and then uh, I'll show you slightly later the layout that we had for educational courses. Um, but essentially, there were two of us who are full time and um, public engagement in the museum, and we needed to be able to move all of those things around to open up the educational space. Um, so that was kind of a benefit of it very easy to move. Um, so I just thought I'd put some pictures on of people um, enjoying being in the Field Museum. So we had a lot of different elements. Anne's going to spot herself on here at some point, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so we had about 1,000, just uh, yeah, around 1,700 um, visitors to the Field Museum uh, from May until September. Obviously, COVID, um, we have to talk about it. That's sort of partly the point of this presentation. It did uh, cause some kind of issues for us in the amount of people that we're able to welcome into the Field Museum and also when we were allowed to open. So obviously we had to wait until um, the government said, yes, uh, you know, museums can now be open. 
um, to be able to have our first open weekend. Um, and yeah, we basically did some very complicated maths that worked out exactly how many people could be in each area of the Field Museum and in their little two metre circular bubbles. Um, so it worked out that we could have 200 people uh, initially and then once restrictions were lifted a bit, we were able to have 400 people um, per day, essentially. So it's, um, yeah, I see everybody's enjoying it. We had boards and bits of the masonry um, thrown from the church, the, the viewing platform, which is these bottom two uh, where people could look out over the site. Um, and that was only during the weekend, so it's not while there was any kind of active excavation going on because obviously it's a churchyard um, excavation, so human remains, um, but they were all covered um, for when the public were in, so nobody could actually see them. Um, has Anne spotted herself yet? <laughs> um, so we had um, uh, the, the aim of the museum rather was to uh, appeal to people of lots of different ages. So as well as having the information boards, which were very interesting and people could read the stones so they could, um, you know, see how, what the church was made up as. We also had a lot of uh, interactive elements um, to engage people of all ages. Um, and one of my favourite parts was these little windows in our um, scaffolding wrap. So that was wrapped um, so you could only see the site from the viewing platform. Um, and in there we uh, had some of the uh, gravestones which we'd found around the church. Um, and you could kind of pop your head in to see them. Um, and this is a, a game of um, pathology. So it kind of has three levels. The, the first one is that you put the skeleton together using... Um, the different pieces, uh, then they have the names uh, of the different bones on the back of them. Um, and then there's another level of like, there's questions um, about different pathologies which are highlighted in red. And so somebody like Anne uh, would be there to sort of talk on a higher level then with, with older children and adults who are interested to learn more about what do archaeologists, osteologists do, you know, what can we tell from particular pathologies? Um, yes. Oh no, I animate the slide. Okay, I'm just going to press this for ages. <laughs> so yeah, as I said, we had um, open days um, between May and September. Um, we had uh, a series of heritage skills courses, which is mostly what I'm going to talk about in the second part of this presentation. Um, we had the monthly update films, which as I say are available on the HS2, HS2 YouTube channel. So uh, please go and have a look at those. We had what's mysteriously called an insight day, and again, we'll come on to that slightly later. Um, then we had our curriculum-linked school resource packs, um, a careers talk at one of the local schools, uh, a session for the young archaeologists, um, a talk at Buckinghamshire History Month, um, and tours, kind of specialist tours for the local archaeologist society. Um, which is Buckinghamshire Archaeological Society, and they've been very involved in the site from, um, well, you know, uh, probably their whole existence of the society, because um, one of their very early presidents of the society um, was uh, buried at the church in the end of the 1800s, um, and he wrote a book which included uh, talking about St Mary's, so books, Archaeological Society, a very long history uh, with the church. Um, so... Um, part, the Field Museum and Educational Opportunities um, were designed to meet the HS2 Herds community engagement um, specific objectives, um, which I believe you can find by Googling them if you want to read a very long <laughs> document. Um, but we also had um, some aims uh, which were a little bit more general of what we wanted the Field Museum to do, especially the educational strands. Um, so we wanted to encourage uh, inclusive participation uh, share knowledge, not just us sharing our knowledge as archaeologists, but also local people sharing their knowledge uh, and their experiences of the site with us and with each other. Um, so stimulate people's curiosity about archaeology, about their local history, um, all sorts. Uh, provide accessible learning opportunities and then to uh, engage people uh, in research relating to the site. So I mentioned we had a different setup for educational courses. So I was designed uh, our field museum by an architect. Um, one of the benefits of that 
was it was very easy to work out exactly how we'd recreate um, an educational space that felt a little bit more enclosed because the field museum was very big and the tent was very high. Um, so to feel a little bit more um, as a group that we were in a bit of a more intimate environment, a little bit more enclosed. Um, but also knowing that um, the whole, you're right on the site, you know, you're at the centre of the excavations. Um, and for people who took one of our courses, um, they were able to go up at the break time to look out over the site um, if they hadn't seen it um, as part of the Field Museum. Um, so again, that gave them the extra kind of feeling of being involved. Um, and yeah, it was, it was a really nice way to use the space. It definitely... Um, definitely worked. Our tables actually ended up being a lot more separate than this so you can see well, they have their little social distancing bubbles but actually we ended up separating tables again just to provide an extra level of um, kind of safety for people. Um, so yeah we had um, four heritage skills courses which Anna probably in the back of her mind is like oh I vaguely remember this. We had a lot of emails. Um, so uh, we did osteology obviously because um, at the centre of our excavations was the churchyard. Um, then also finds recording, um, archaeological illustration and church graffiti recording because um, one thing that people, especially locally, knew about St Mary's and some people are nodding great, is that they found quite a lot of um, graffiti slash uh, protective marks uh, from medieval early modern period um, during the eval phase. So um, we definitely wanted to include that. Um, and the aim of our courses was to uh, offer local people the opportunity to come in, experience the site um, and uh, gain some skills which they can then share with others and, and kind of use to develop their own understanding of their local area and kind of promote their local history within their local area. I said local about a million times there, but you know what I mean. So... Um, Boring slide. <laughs> we matched. <laughs> There's no pictures. We matched the um, learning objectives to the courses to uh, national occupational standards. Um, so contributing and supporting um, the performance and knowledge requirements for um, different ones. I'll leave that up for a moment so you can have a little read. Um, but yeah, essentially. Um, the focus of the courses was to understand the archaeological uh, the methodology of uh, recording that particular um, artifact or um, yeah, human remains graffiti um, and then to create a record for it. So the two um, aims of the uh, courses. Well done, Lily. Happy? Yeah, <laughs> there's, not, there's nothing up close, but FYI. Uh, okay, so this is an uh, osteology course, so you get a bit of more of an idea of the um, setup for the way that we uh, did the courses. So it was all uh, under social distancing, um, masks, etc. although by the point this was taken, they had become um, optional. Um, and we had a uh, projector. And then we had our, um, so this was our kind of learning the methodology section. And then uh, in the second half of the day, you would move on to the tables and, and take part in some recording. Um, so obviously, when we're uh, running the osteology course, we have to be um, very careful with the way that everything is presented. Um, there are people living locally. In fact, some people who came on the osteology course who had relatives who were buried in the churchyard. Um, and not distant relatives by any mean. It was their great aunt, I think. So, they, you know, it was a, it was a close uh, connection, family connection to that area and to the people um, buried there. Now, um, everybody who, uh, the remains that we use, the individuals, they were um, anonymous. We didn't know who they were. They were all older than 200 years. Um, and obviously, we just use adults. So in that way, you know, we're sort of doing our best to make sure that... Um, we're kind of protecting both the, the people who were buried there and the people who were taking part in the courses. Um, and yes, so um, they had an introduction to osteology, the processes, um, you know, what we do, how we do it, why we do it, the ethics um, of osteology uh, by myself, um, our assistant public engagement archaeologist, and also then Don Walker, who was on loan from MOLA. Um, and uh, he gave people this incredible insight into some of the pathologies um, from St Mary's that they would then go on to look at when they were recording an individual later on in the day. So here we are 
uh, in our socially distanced groups um, recording uh, an individual from St Mary's. Um, so this is actually one area in which um, social distancing um, created uh, a, a slightly different way of, of working with, um, you know, recording the human remains that worked quite well because I think if we hadn't had to be in socially distanced groups, there may have been a push to just use one individual and everybody to record one individual. Uh, whereas um, because we're socially distanced and in a group of, of two, um, it allowed for um, a kind of more in-depth recording and then the opportunity for the groups to share what they'd learned with each other. So they weren't just kind of doing the recording, they were then working out how do I explain this to, you know, to the other people who are taking part in the course and using the language which um, the osteologists have taught us to use. Um, so that worked really, really well. And the way that people spoke about the individual that they recorded was actually really touching. They developed this very kind of, although it was only about two hours, a very deep connection with that person and with their uh, kind of lived experience and how their life might have been based on the pathologies that they had, the age that they were. So yeah, it worked really well. And um, this is some kind of examples of the different recordings, so looking for pathologies and measuring the bones. They also look for, for example, staining on the bones, things like that. Just a couple of minutes. Oh my gosh, we need to whip through. Okay. Um, so this is just an example of the other course we did. So we did archaeological um, illustration, um, which I was very excited to do because I thought I would be brilliant at it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I had good fun, which is all we can ask for. Whereas some of the people who took part, as you can see, were amazing and definitely have like a future career, well, probably in any part of osteology, but in archaeology, but yeah, beautiful drawings. Um, we did some graffiti recording, so one benefit, another benefit of COVID, and it's amazing to think it had benefits, but, but in this particular pile it did. Um, so it meant that we could ask people like Matthew Champion who's an expert on medieval graffiti, to dial in and talk to us and we could show him some graffiti and once we had recorded it. Um, whereas we would never really have been able to, it would have been a lot more money for him to come all the way across the country, um, you know, to run uh, part of the course. So it worked really, really well. Um, maybe I'll just recording some graffiti. And this was great because as well as making a record of that as part of the course and this is also contributing to our knowledge of the site because when you're looking for graffiti, uh, medieval graffiti in churches, you need a lot of eyes um, to be able to spot different things. Um, so as you can see there's a lot of graffiti just in this very small section and it takes uh, a sharp eye or a lot of people looking at the same stone to pick out different aspects of it. So uh, a couple of things that we identified um, as a possible mason's mark um, and then, a, but probably as you can see from the drawing, a fleur de lis. So yeah, some really nice little examples that you would never spot as like just looking at it one time. Um, yeah, and the recording that people did as well was something was really beautiful. Um, okay, so the insight day. Um, we really wanted to do some kind of work experience. Uh, program however with COVID and with the nature of the site and health and safety um, various things um, we kind of had to think about a slightly different way to do it and so what we did was we worked through um, Fusion who uh, contracted us on behalf of HS2 um, and they often work with speakers of schools to do some virtual work experience um, so we took that on board and we created what we called the insight day which was basically uh, a whole day where students from uh, across the country could apply to do it, uh, 14 to 18 year olds. Um, so we had panel talks of uh, people of different aspects of archaeology so that they could see kind of the wide variety, not just of jobs, but of how people got into archaeology and how they got into their job. Um, and then in the afternoon, they did a group uh, research project together. So they split up into groups. Um, and because we were 
working on the churchyard, we asked them to look at the ethics of displaying human remains in museums. Obviously, in the Field Museum, we didn't um, have any human remains on display. That was a very conscious choice we made. So we wanted them to get engaged in um, what is a debate within not only the heritage sector, but museums. And um, there's a lot of information online that they can research. And then they put together um, presentations um, on their thoughts. And, as you can see, it made most of them, 81% uh, who answered our survey, uh, more interested in a career of archae in archaeology than they had been um, before. So that was, that was a good benefit. OK, this is, my, this is my last thing. It's not really, but the okay. most <laughs> <laughs> Um, so one great opportunity um, which we were able to get involved in is uh, with the University of East London and their architecture students and we gave them a brief and we took them on a tour of the site and we asked them to create a landscape model um, of St Mary's and apparently it's very different to anything that um, they're used to doing as architects because um, they're used to going to a space and thinking about what they will build, whereas we're asking them to go to a space and think about how it used to be. And basically, they created different models that took us all the way back through the past in the landscape. Um, so yeah, that was a really great experience for them. They can put it in their portfolios. I'm just going to flick through these slides. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> um, OK, then it's just... just um, a little bit of feedback um, from our participants, but basically um, they really enjoyed doing the courses. One problem, I'd say, uh, our only problem with it taking part uh, and the working site, because obviously people really love that aspect. However, occasionally it can be a little bit noisy on an archaeological site, so we did have occasional problems with the noise. Um, but apart from that, people um, really enjoyed the courses. And, um, yeah. Lily, thank I you got to that. the end. <laughs>